Welcome back to Cinema Flex Music Picks. I'm Davey, your host for the most, the beast with the least. Oh, the least we can do today is contrast two very different years, 2018 and this year, 2022. Remember back in 2018, before the event, um, when Jodie just started as the Doctor and Doctor Who, and uh, man babies uh, lost their minds, all of them, most of us were very, very tolerant and accepting. Um, but, uh, you know, there was, there was a, a great welling and gnashing of teeth from some people. Um, and Chris Gibno said there's going to be um, a completely fresh take on Doctor Who. No returning villains, no returning elements, bar the Doctor and the TARDIS. All you need to know is the Doctor travels in space and time and you're good to go. Boy, did that not last, Chris, Chris, Chris Gibno. Um, I don't know who replaced him, but he changed. Um, and none more so than the sets we're going to look at today with these three episodes. So we have the rather lovely artwork, which I don't think is by Alice Shang, but it's certainly inspired by the artwork that she uh, started with uh, the Peter Capaldi Series 9 steel book, which has now been used for every new series set except for Series 11. See, I told you Series 11 is an outlier, that 2018 series. Um, and on the back we have our cast of guest characters, which uh, for some reason does not include Kate Lethbridge-Stewart. Um, so Gemma Redgrave must have been stealing from the BBC canteen again. What's she like? Um, it'll be a bit jumbled, I think, because I don't really want to review uh, the first two episodes because it's so long ago that you know what you're thinking. Come on now. Um, and there's not terribly much to talk about. Eve of the Daleks was a wonderfully fun episode. Um, by far the best of the Dalek New Year's specials that we've had, and quite why the Daleks need to be reserved for New Year's. Only Chibnall knows. Um, but to have um, the restrictions of COVID that were in place at the time, um, you'd think would limit Chris Chibnall's imagination. Instead, it, it really gave us a wonderfully tense but fun Dalek story. A variation on Live, Die, Repeat, where our core cast of the TARDIS crew, well, I won't say fam, I don't like that, um, our TARDIS crew, um, are exterminated over and over, um, along with the guest cap cast, including Island B. Um, and every time they're exterminated, they lose a minute. When they come back, they're resurrected by time itself. It's a, uh, a fallout of what happened in the previous season, Flux. Um, as, as we can see here, the TARDIS is still covered in the Flux residue. Uh, which are kind of ready. Um, Really, it's just an excuse for a good uh, Dalek romp in a warehouse, um, and it's great. Island B's hilarious, likable. Um, the other guy in it's quite creepy. I'm not sure why she'd fall from, but there we go. Um, but really, the most uh, joyous thing to come out of that is um, the notion that Yaz and the Doctor really do have romantic feelings for each other. How wonderfully progressive! I'm, I'm grateful that Chris actually went there. Um, and Dan the Man, as played by John Bishop, um, proved already in Flux, but it certainly proves again in um, in the first of the two specials that um, he's a, a, a wonderful companion for being a, a, a side man almost. He's like the companion's companion, so he's Yaz's companion almost. Um, so he's he's able to kind of say to Yaz, if you're not told her yet, she, you know, I know you like her, everybody can see it. And then he'll say to the Doctor, if you're not told her yet, I know you like her, everybody can see it. Um, and the Doctor and Yaz do have those feelings. Um, so it's wonderful that the show goes there. What's well, not so wonderful, and again, spoilers for uh, Power of the Doctor, and if you've not seen it, come on, come on. Um, I think he kind of chickens out a little bit. Um, it does explore beautifully um, as Jodie departs um, the relationship with Yaz and that Yaz does have these feelings and the Doctor does indeed reciprocate them but it falls back in that old trope that the Doctor's had for numerous companions and the new era of Doctor Who that you know I, I, I live for, I go on and on and you don't and, you know it's right back to the Tenant Rose thing so I thought that was a bit lazy. And what Chibnall could have really done just to say, 
I'm on the way out anyway. Why not do this? Just have them have one almighty kiss. Just one great big Yaz doctor kiss just to really annoy the right people on the way out the door. It would have been wonderful. But most importantly, it would have been a great combination of their actual story. Yeah, because they did have romantic feelings for each other and it feels like uh, something of a tragedy now that um, they're not going to have that um, to, you know, to explore further because we know that this is literally the end of the 13th dot so there's going to be no more. Um, so Yaz gets to be the only companion ever um, to be a multi-series companion who gets to travel with the Doctor from start to finish. Um, she meets the Doctor when the Doctor has literally just regenerated and fallen out the TARDIS into a train and she's with the Doctor while she's dying. So Yaz yeah, is the only the only companion who can, can really say that. Um, Rose can kind of say it but Christopher Eccleston stuck about for one season so that's a bit of a cop-out answer. Um, whereas Yaz was in series 11, 12, 13 and the specials. So. You know, she really did get time with the doctor. Um, so you can really buy that. Yeah, she did want to stick about because she had those feelings, and I think that's why, you know, a, a really romantic moment would have been earned. But hey, hey ho, hey ho, they probably cut it out so they can show it in China. That's the kind of thing people say these days. I don't know if it's true or not. Uh, Disney made them do it. They knew the, the Disney deal was coming. Disney made them do it. Um, and then we get Legends of the uh, Sea Devils, which uh, it's just a, it reminded me of Plan of the Dead. It's very much just an adventure story before the big epic uh, finale of the Doctor. So we have um, pirates, seventeenth um, century China. Um, Good to see a historical set in China for the first time since Marco Polo way back in William Hartnell's first run. Blimey. Um, good to see a pirate story, um, a different kind of pirate story, so not like Matt Smith's uh, one from um, Series 6 with Hugh Bonneville. Curse of the Black Spot, was it? Um, wasn't a great episode, though. Um, I think the... Uh, the Sea Devils are just, they weren't reimagined really terribly well, I think they looked kind of goofy, um, and I don't think the episode was particularly exciting anyway, it just you know, didn't feel, didn't feel very, very of, very special for something called the 13th uh, uh, Doctor uh, Season 13 specials. Um, but again, that's in keeping with Planet of the Dead because that, to me, although they went to the Middle East and took a bloody double-decker bus there, I thought that was really quite dull as well. So at least it's in keeping with that era where we, we do have a rather tedious story in between two really fun ones. Let's just go straight into the fun one then. Um, so there's a reason why I didn't actually go through um, who's on the back because I thought, let's save it for here. Um, our cast of characters includes for these, so we've obviously got Yaz, well, first of all, your Doctor. We've got Yaz, Mandeep Gill. We've got John Bishop as Dan. Um, we've got Ashad, the lone Cyberman, but it's not really Ashad, it's fake Ashad, the clone one. Um, we've got a sea devil. Um, and we have the Fluxy Tardis. And we have a Dalek, one of the two from uh, the special. Um, and then we have the rather dashing version looking of uh, of uh, the Master with uh, Sasha Dewan. Um, he's definitely doing the more, you know, uh, Clark Kent thing there, isn't he? Um, he's doing the, that's the, the kind of professorial part where he's uh, doing the lecture hall thing with the uh, everybody in the, the tissue compression eliminator um, part. Um, a couple of missed opportunities on here, as I mentioned. Where's Where's Kate Stewart? Why is Ashad here? And why is the Master not Rasputin? That should be a big picture of the Rasputin Master. If that Master is going to be remembered for one bloody thing, it's going to be that in this episode, Power of the Doctor, for no reason other than he's the Master and he's kind of like that. He has a wonderful dance sequence to Bon A.M.'s Ra Ra Rasputin, Russians, Russia's greatest love machine. Wow, 
um, very much in the vein of John Sim singing, I can't decide whether you should live or die, um, and the sound of drums, um, and very much, uh, what was it, last, yeah, last of the time, Lord, um, and in the vein of, hey, Missy, you're so fine, you're so fine, you blah, man, hey, Missy. Um, I was a little bit annoyed at first, because I, I love Sasha Dewan, and for him to play the master and be an old master type, where he just hates the doctor because he's the master and that's the doctor and that's what we do. It felt very... Mm, come on, we just did a great redemption art with Missy and now you just want to re reset the whole thing. What's the point in that? But then I kind of say to myself, well, why should Chris Chibnall be forced to live in someone else's um, idea of Doctor Who? So if, if he's more happy with the, the more traditional panto villain master versus good doctor hey why not and sasha plays it to the hilt why does he dress as rasputin because he can why does he have paintings um throughout history be desecrated with his face as rasputin because he can it's just the kind of thing the master does just to get units attention the doctor's attention just to mess around he's almost um it's almost about time meddlery um for a classic who reference and speaking of classic who reference um he gets one of one of the most meta puns again chris chibnall the guy who said fresh start for doctor who no continuity makes reference to the daleks master plan when the the master says i think i think i'm going to call it the daleks master plan or should it be the master's dialect plan which was also a title used by big finish audio um, wonderful stuff where the the, um, the the master essentially has come up with one of his ridiculously intricate boneheaded schemes to just <laughs> to just cause mayhem pandemonium and make the doctor's life a misery um, he controls the cyber lords or the cyber masters whatever they're bloody called which look great but I thought they were blown up. Where did they get them? I don't know. Who cares? They're gone now, anyway. Um, he controls the Daleks, or he's, he's made a pact between his Cybermen and the Daleks, um, and they're kind of doing the old tropey thing of joining up, uh, which they never used to do. Remember the whole, this was pest control from uh, from Doomsday and back in Series 2? Well, since the uh, the Pandorica in Series 5, we've had... Um, the you know a conglomerate of enemies joining forces to take down the Doctor every so often. So here we get Master Dalek, Cyberman. So you know big three really. So what indeed is the power of the Doctor? Well, bit cheesy to say, but the power of the Doctor is her friends. So here we get Sophie Aldred back as Ace as Dorothy McShane. And we get Janet Fielding back as Tegan Javanka. So we're pulling from Peter Davison's era and Sylvester McCoy's era, bringing them right forward. Um, and again, the Masters even get dialogue with them that only fan fanboys and fangirls would, would know about. I mean, he taunts um, Tegan for, uh, how's your Aunt Vanessa, you know? When, uh, you know, he killed Aunt Vanessa in 1981 when it was Tom Baker still there. Um, and Ace says, uh, last time I saw you, you were a cat or half cat. That was in Survival. Hardly anybody was watching by the time Survival was, was bloody on. So Chris Chibnall was replaced by Doppel Chibnall um, at some point made a completely different uh, show because he was putting in all these continuity references that you just think what happened to series 11 Chris Chibnall? What the hell happened? He'd already kind of dipped his toe in the water with the Timeless Child arc uh, really ripping uh, continuity apart and speaking of which I'm representing with uh, Joe Martin here today um, and it was great to see Joe putting an appearance in this. It wouldn't have been right to uh, end the series without Joe coming back for for a few minutes just to uh, to spread her wonderfulness. So I'd love to uh, have seen more of her, but I'm glad she's getting some big finish audios. And so is Sasha as the master. So that'll be fun. I'm looking forward to those. Whoever there are um, 
a few elephants in the room that need a dress. And again, spoilers, 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 spoilers. The 50th anniversary, again, had a lot of people a bit peeved, including Colin Baker himself. When Tom Baker was elected to essentially represent all of Classic Who, um, by being the only one in the 50th anniversary of special filming news sequences, although I guess Paul McGann, Paul McGann did the uh, Night of the Doctor, which is wonderful. I am a doctor, but probably not the one you expected. Yeah, um, yeah love that. Um, but Colin was peeved, uh, Peter Davison's made reference to it over the years, and what do we have here? Well, the Doctor has her regenerations, or her current regeneration, stolen by the Master. So the Master literally becomes the Doctor. Um, Jodie's soul, if you want to put it that way, is in the Matrix, maybe? Something like that. The Time Lord Matrix? Who knows? Um, but if there's a Time Lord... Uh, River sticks. Then the ferrymen here were played by Colin Baker, Peter Davison, Sylvester McCoy, Paul McGann, and David Bradley. So you've got your first Doctor, ish. Um, you've got the f uh, fifth Doctor, sixth Doctor, seventh Doctor, and eighth Doctor. Wow, how wonderful was it to see them? Um, just to have them back into. Th for them to have their moment um, and have it in such an organic way um, and have it in a way that didn't feel silly. Um, Colin couldn't come back with that rainbow outfit and expect an audience not to laugh. Just couldn't. I mean, first of all, he's nearly 80. Just be silly. Um, to have them wearing these kind of robes um, made them look very distinguished and time lordy, as, uh, you know, and, and whatnot. And I love that... that Paul McGann stood apart and says, "Yeah, I, I, I don't do robes." So even though it's um, it's a kind of afterlife of the Doctor, <laughs> where regenerations go to just hang about eternity, Paul McGann still still kind of standing alone from the rest of them, as he did for years when uh, people refused to recognise him, and more fool them because they missed out on a lot of great um, BBC books and big Finnish audios, to, and still do it to this day. Apart from Stranded Four, which was rubbish, um, but so it was great to have the Doctors coming back, um, even if not quite as the Doctors as a part of the Doctors' aspects, uh, part of their psyche, almost like the Watcher from um, Legopolis, but for the Doctor, for this Doctor, was other Doctors, which was really cool. So Jodie um, meets essentially the soul of her previous selves, which was just so cool to see. And it was great to see her face to face with them and seeing them flip between all the different generations. And then there's an AI interface that she's left in case anything terminal should happen, a bit like Eccleston did for Rose uh, back in Part of the Ways, um, where it looks like the doctor that you're expecting to see, so so Mandeep uh, Yaz sees Jodie, but later in the episode, when Ace is on, and I'm not going to go through the whole plot, cause I'm, no. when Ace is on the mission in the volcano, where Graham shows up, <laughs> they film the chase in some weird places these days, um, when Ace is on the mission in a volcano, it's such a weird sentence to say anyway, um, when she sees the Doctor's AI interface, it turns into Sylvester McCoy. And they have a wonderful moment where they get to essentially reflect on, and it's very intricately written because there's been so many endings for the Ace and the Seventh Doctor through the comics, through Big Finish and through the novels, that Chris found a way to kind of remedy them all and just say, they had a fallen out. That will do. You don't need to be too intricate. You don't need to do the death of Ace. You don't need to do the leather Ace from the Virgin New Adventures, etc., etc. So they had a fallen out. Um, and she says, so we're, are we good, Professor? And then when he says, we're better than good, we're Ace. 
the tears didn't stop when Tegan, um, who doesn't have as much to do, but um, come on, Ace was always more the action star. Tegan um, has her, uh, it's not really a mission, but she's more in unit HQ uh, helping out Kate. Um, and she takes the initiative, which I really liked because Tegan was, was quite often just the, you know, why can't you get me back to the airport, Doctor? You know, moaning a lot, although I love Tegan. I think she was such a fun addition. Uh, I liked the, the bickering TARDIS uh, of the Fifth Doctor era. Um, but when she has a bit more agency in this story and urgency and she's helping a unit and she's coming up with ideas and plots and schemes to beat the Cybermen, when she sees her doctor, the fifth doctor, and she kind of refuses to believe that it is him, and she says, okay, well, if I'm looking around seeing all these Cybermen, what would I be thinking? And the fifth doctor, AI, because it is the doctor, it's an AI, but it has the doctor's consciousness, just says, Adric. Matthew Waterhouse is out there and living a very happy life, but I died. And Niagara Falls, I cried. I, I, I started crying watching this episode. Just the one word, Adric. <sighs> yeah. Tegan's departure was one of the most mature of the, the classic series for me, where she just says, it's just not fun for me anymore. It's just too much death. That's a very new series concept, and uh, it was great to to revisit that. With uh, you know, she still remembers Adric and still honors him. You know, it was, it was great to see. Um, but overall, what I really loved about the power of the Doctor is that it was a celebration of the Doctor's friends being the reason that she'll always win, even if, as it's not a spoiler to say, because we know Jodie's gone, she dies. She comes back, she regenerates. And the reason that the Master will never truly win is because he doesn't have the power of the Master, which is friends. He can force people like he does here with Yaz to do his bidding. He can use mind control as he does here, as Rasputin. But he doesn't have just love, and he doesn't have friendship, and he doesn't have dedication, and he doesn't have togetherness, and he doesn't have the power of the Doctor, which is... Okay, fam. Wonderful stuff. It was uh, some of the most beautiful stuff that Chris has come up with during this whole tenure as showrunner. Um, and I just thought, wow, just gorgeous. Um, and after Peter uh, Capaldi's beautiful uh, departure episode, the uh, Twice Upon a Time, which was a real elegiac um, look. Uh, the death of a time lord and what it means to the doctor to die and you know why should I have to save the universe and you know can't I have peace at last you know could I have, is this my fate to just ha exist just to help other people then realizing wait a minute that's, that's a pleasure that's an honor not a burden you know wow um, but how do you do that how do you top that well you don't so you do something completely fresh for a new Who, um, which is have an upbeat regeneration for the first time. Christopher Eccleston was sad because although he's trying to placate Rose, he's dying and she's freaking out. Tenants was over the top sad for me. Matt Smith's was, while well, he was so good at speeches that he kind of made it sad, even though it was, you know, I will always remember when the doctor was me. Niagara Falls again. I'm very emo, you know. Um, but for Jodie, that's never been her doctor. She's not been a speech of fire. She's not been somebody to have these great emotional outbursts, although she does have emotions and she's very friendly and upbeat. That's her character, um, which it took me a long time to work out what Jodie's character was. And it's just being a friend. That's what Jodie's doctor's main trait is. It's not being dark, it's not being brooding, it's not being the manipulator, it's not being the adventurer, it's being a friend. Um, so for for her, it wouldn't have been in, in keeping with her to have a big epic end where she dies with a great speech. She has to, has to go in a Jodie way 
a more better way than just having a very subdued goodbye to Yaz and you know with an undercurrent of I wish we could have had but we can't and then seeing a beautiful sunset with a whoever's the next tag you're it think of all the great regeneration speeches we've had you know doctor I'll let you go and, you know I don't want to go and uh, you know you were you were fantastic absolutely fantastic you know what so was I and you know right back to uh, it's the end the moment it's been prepared for and you know a tear Sarah Jane and, you know um, yeah gorgeous stuff Jodie gets to just essentially play tag with her future self it's gorgeous absolutely gorgeous what a lovely notion and what a very Jodie notion. And what a very Chris Chibnall notion. I think at the end, Chris Chibnall found a way to bring this whole era round about again. And I didn't think watching series 11, which I wasn't a great fan of, that Chris Chibnall and Jodie Whittaker were right for this. I really didn't. I like Jodie Whittaker. I think she's a fantastic actress. But I thought her doctor just wasn't Doctor Who. Um, but how wrong was I? How wrong was I? Um, I think she's a, a fantastic doctor um, and a totally unique doctor who stands alone from all the others. And this shows it by having some of the others. Um, and yeah, Chris, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, I think Series 11 was a misfire. I think Jodie's um, performances were held back and restrained because she was written far too safely. And by not having the Daleks and the Cybermen and, and threats that you know, and by having Tim Shaw's or Big Bad, you, you, you're taking Moriarty away from Sherlock Holmes, you know. You, you take away the great threat, then, you know, what, 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 what is the yin without the yang? So when Jodie starts to have the familiars added, Jodie rose to the occasion and she never backed down again. And yeah, for me, she's just risen and risen with every subsequent appearance since she does live in every single one um, to become somebody who just makes me smile thinking about her. I will always, always smile thinking of Jodie Whittaker's daughter, and I think that's what she is. She's the doctor that smiles. Smiles, by the way, not smells. <coughs> that was why I'm hard on. So anyway, I've talked for nearly half an hour. Um, what's next? Again, we're doing spoilers. We knew because it's all you know to get publicity for the show and you know to publicise the fact that Disney are taking over the worldwide distribution. They already announced that David Tennant was coming back for specials next year, and so is uh, Catherine Tate. But it was still a great surprise to see David Tennant actually become the new Doctor. And when the BBC said officially that David Tennant's the 14th Doctor, he's not just come back as the 10th Doctor, he's a new incarnation. That's exciting. How's that going to play out? I've got no idea. And I trust Russell T Davis because although he was burnt out by the end, I think, um, in the subsequent years, Russell has pff, years and years, it's a sin. The guy's got even better. So I'm really looking forward to next year's specials. Uh, we've got Neil Patrick Harris. Um, some people think he's playing the toy maker. That would be a callback and a half. Um, but I don't think they'll add the celestial part. But yeah, so Doctor Who, eh? Doctor Who is still going strong after coming up to 60 years. And bless it. Well, mate, well, may continue. And uh, Joe, I will be day one for your Big Finish audios, my dear. And Jody, if, if you join Big Finish anytime, I'll be there for you as well. And, Indeed, any, any ancillary characters. The Master, of course, we know is getting one. And uh, Professor Jericho, um, Kevin McNally's character, is also joining Big Finish. So that'll be exciting. We'll be getting a little uh, pamphlet advertising some uh, some things. So what's Doctor Who origin stories? So it's just giving you some, some origins. And there's Davros at the top. Big Finish have already done the origin of Davros. And they also done, uh, you can hardly see them, Kate Lethbridge, Stuart. Uh, Missy, we've already had an origin of Missy too in uh, Missy's anthology 
um, some comic books, uh, Doctor Who, The Edge of Reality and the Lonely Assassins, and then the uh, the new uh, Target adaptations of The Fires of Pompeii and The Eaters of Light. Who thought The Eaters of Light would get novelisation, eh? Lowest rated uh, overnights in, in uh, the whole new show. Just after me saying, I bet you they don't use the Celestial part of the Celestial toy maker because he was a little bit racist. Here's an advert for the Celestial toy maker with Michael Goff, the vinyl version. But uh, wow, well, when it's vintage TV, I think you get away with uh, a little bit more. Um, we've got uh, just some various audios, including Sophie Aldred's. Um, a childhood's end, the, the a charitable earth uh, adventure, um, and what's that one? Roger Delgado, just the master collection. That's why I could hardly read it. Um, some more big finish. Uh, with some short trips. Uh, what was the wonder? Doctor Who magazine. Um, I don't even know why I'm showing you all this. I'm in Fortnite. Oh, I wish it was coming back in a fortnight, but we've got over a year to wait until the next drop to her. However, I've done half an hour again. Don't know how I always do half an hour, but hey, Doctor Who's been my thing since I was eight years old watching UK Gold in the early 90s. Uh, I mean the 2010s, I'm not that old. Shut up. Um, so, you know, I did a video on Flux, so I think it's only fair that I say cheerio to Jodie and celebrate what worked about her era, which very much did work, and uh, and say thank you Jodie, thank you Mandeep, thank you Chris, um, thank you Sasha, thank you Tossin, thank you um, Bradley, thank you John Bishop, thank you Joe Martin, um, and thank you for watching should you have made it this far, but uh, hey, this has just been another ramble, but that's what you're here for. Well folks, enjoy your weeks, I'll be back at some point during the week, I think, yeah, later this week with something, but until then, stay very safe out there and uh, Love and mercy, my dears. Love and indeed mercy.